also excited to introduce Sarah. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her this past summer at the N the NIMS Sea Grant Fellowship Annual Science Symposium. And I knew once I met her that I had to bring her in to one of our seminar series to share her science. Um, and today's the day she said yes. <laughs> a little bit more about Sarah. Um, she's a, P a PhD candidate at Stony Brook University School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, advised by Dr. Janet Nye, and as like I mentioned, as well as a NIMS Sea Grant Population and Ecosystem Dynamics Fellow. Her dissertation research explores ecological resilience during a period of rapid warming on the Northeast U.S. continental shelf, working closely with folks like Sean Lucy, Sarah Geiches, and Dave Richardson of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and she collaborates with Karim Aiden and Andy Whitehouse of the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Sarah is also the co-founder of the New York City-based nonprofit Biobus, a science outreach organization known for its mobile laboratories, which have reached over 350,000 students since 2008. And prior to launching Biobus, Sarah completed a Bachelor of Arts at Harvard College and a master's degree at the Wiseman Institute of Science. She also proudly holds a commercial driver's license and is happy to talk about bus driving at any time. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation with Sarah, the stories of her work with the nonprofit Biobus are so worth hearing, and I hope you take it that time to learn more about her the next time you get to meet her in person. Um, Sarah will take questions as we go. Uh, and folks that are online, you can either use the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar, or if you have a, like a longer question or want to, and Sarah is completely open to this and might, it might even be her preference, use the raise hand feature and I can uh, elevate you to panelists so that you can actually talk with Sarah rather than this sort of black box back and forth. It just depends on um, your preference and level of question. And then, of course, we've got Terrence uh, with the uh, in staff support for questions as well. With that, um, everyone, please help me welcome Sarah. Sarah, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen, for inviting me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. And yes, please do interrupt me, ask questions. Um, Kristen, if I miss something in the chat, just let me know. Absolutely. Um, so the work I'll be talking about today is all focused here in the Gulf of Maine. And as was mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working with a variety of folks at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center on these the dissertation projects that I'll talk about that are still ongoing. And I got interested in the Gulf of Maine because, as you might have heard, the Gulf of Maine is warming very rapidly. Um, I think this figure is, shows that in one, one way, looking at um, sea surface temperature anomalies in the Gulf of Maine in blue, over the past several decades compared to the global average. And another way of seeing this, perhaps even more striking, honestly, is that is this figure looking at the days that are classified as heat wave days um, compared to a long-term average. So anything in black is considered a heat wave event. As you can see, in 2012, almost the entire year, counts as a heat wave. Uh, and similarly, in 2021 and 2022, and much of the time in between. So with that, it's probably no surprise that um, there's been discussion of regime shift, of, kind of referring to these changes as constituting a regime shift, um, both in the Gulf of Maine and in the larger Northwest Atlantic region. One example of this is an observed step change in the number of warm core rings coming off of the Gulf Stream in about the year 2000, the large step up. And these changes, of course, have not only been physical. Um, there have been observations of biological changes as well. 
And for example, um, there's been an observed increase in lobster abundance, decline in cod, and increase in species like black sea bass that were once considered to be pretty rare, as well as a number of others. The thing is that most of these changes have been described and observed at the level of single species, kind of like I just went through. And what I've been curious about is when you zoom out and you look at the Gulf of Maine system in its entirety as a food web, is there an identifiable difference, an identifiable regime shift? Or are the species kind of subbing in for one another and at the level of kind of the food web function and structure, things might be the same. And a related question is like, um, has the resilience of the food web changed? And resilience and regime shift are very linked concepts, at least in the way that I think about them and the way that I use them. And I do know that the word resilience can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'll just spend a moment kind of going through what I mean. Um, and there's this classic kind of analogy, visual analogy that I'll use to where you have a, a ball in a cup. Uh, the ball is a complex system like a food web, right? And that ball can exist stably in multiple states, or these two different troughs here. However, the states are not equivalent in their resilience, insofar as it's easy to move from the left to the right than the reverse. In other words, the version of this state on the right is more resilient, is, is, takes more perturbation to move backwards. Um, so when I ask, you know, has there been a regime shift or a resilience change? It's relevant both because you might change to a, a different system with a different resilience state, or a change in resilience might be kind of a creeping, you know, along this curve such that the system might be more or perhaps less prone to regime shift in the future. Okay, so to get at that, right, I had to build a food web model and that's what you see here. So this model is a starting model that starts in that kind of pre-warming period in the early 1980s. So it's parameterized for 1980 to 1985. And it's built in R path, which is uh, the, an R-based instantiation of the EcoPath with EcoSim mass balance modeling algorithms that has been developed by Karim Aiden and Sean Lucy and Sarah Geiches and others um, who've been incredible at supporting me through many years of this work. And the way to look at this, um, in case you're not familiar with it, it's hopefully intuitive, each node is a functional group. Some can be aggregate like microzooplankton and some can be single species. And each line is a trophic interaction. Um, I will maybe pause I can go into more detail about how I built this model if folks are interested, or I can keep going, but just wanna see if there's any like super pressing model specific questions before I continue. Wait, awkwardly. I'll I'll join in so you're not alone. Um, for folks <laughs> that um, <laughs> joined um, a little later, please feel free to jump in at any point using the Q&A box at the, or I guess it's on the bottom for me, I'm not sure where it is for you. Um, or you could also use the raise hand feature and I can uh, change permissions so that you can talk directly with Sarah. Okay. Um, assuming there's not many other questions, I'll just point out that, you know, there's more resolution, greater resolution here, this upper middle upper part of the food web because Oh, these are based on um, bottom trawl survey data, whereas both the lower and trophic levels, then higher trophic levels tend to be more aggregate groups. All right, so I said I wanted to analyze the resilience of this food web over time. Um, how do we do that? And I've been relying on a suite of tools called ecological network analysis, and in particular, one metric from that analytical framework. That is this efficiency, also called ascendancy metric. And I wanted to say here that um, all of the uh, metrics that I'll talk about, they're not new. I didn't invent them. They come primarily from Bobby Lanowitz's work. And they've, and they've been 
you know, around in the food web modeling literature for many years now, but they haven't really made it over into being useful for management and to being applied. And I actually saw a, a, a survey go around a bunch of modelers recently asking which metrics are being implemented in, in management. And everyone said that these ones, ecological network analysis, are not being used because they're too complicated, too hard to explain, not intuitive, too theoretical. And as Kristen kind of mentioned, I'm my background from uh, before I started my PhD was in science outreach and education and communication. And so when I hear that this metric is too complicated, I think, well, maybe that's kind of a communication issue more than it is a metric issue. So I'll try to convince you that at least this particular metric that I'm using could be delivered in a way that makes it a bit more intuitive and, and hopefully relevant. All right. So but that, let me just explain why I'm showing you these two schematics here. Um, so the, the, I like this kind of drawing because you have two food webs with the same nodes and the same connections, the same wiring essentially, but a different weighting of flow and let's say biomass or energy. So the version on the left is more, the flows are more evenly distributed, which makes it less efficient. The, the version on the right has more streamlined, greater efficiency, but with greater efficiency comes lower resilience. And I, an analogy that I often use to think about this is thinking about supply chains, um, like which maybe we've all heard a little bit too much about, but um, a few years ago, you might remember there was a big crisis over baby formula because it turns out that there's only a few suppliers of baby formula in the US and when one of those suppliers collapsed, there was a chaos in the system. Um, and so uh, uh, anything like this, which is more streamlined, a system such that's more streamlined in this fashion means that you're more dependent on any particular flow pathway to keep the system functional. Uh, now, Kristen said that uh, you guys want like to get into the weeds. So... I'm gonna get into the weeds on how the efficiency metric is calculated, just a little. It, it comes from information theory, um, where there's this concept of entropy associated with the probability of events within the system. So um, a classic example is usually a coin flip. And if you have a coin with two heads, you have, you know, let's say two heads, your probability of heads is one, the The outcome is totally determined. There's very little entropy or there's actually no entropy or uncertainty in the system. Similarly, if you have a head uh, coin with two tails and you have maximal entropy when your probability is right smack there in the middle. So you can calculate entropy this way. You can also think about joint and conditional entropy in a case where you have events that are not totally independent. Here, you can decompose the entropy associated with Y into a component that is joint with X or conditional on it and conditional on X. How do we apply that to a food web? So here, the event of interest is no longer a coin flip, but, but the movement of a single unit of biomass from one node to another. So let's say here from elex to cod, and we know the, the volume, the amount of that flow, shown here as t, and we, the probability of this occurring is the t i j over the sum of all the flows in the system, which is usually shown as this t dot dot. So that H gives you the entropy associated with an entire food web. And it's often useful to scale entropy to the size of the system. So we get something called capacity, essentially just by knocking out this denominator. And just as before I said, you can decompose entropy into two components. You can decompose capacity into ascendancy, which is the same thing as this joint or mutual information and overhead. So 
this ascendancy metric gives you the amount of constraint. Um, and the sort of overhead gives you a, a metric of redundancy. And here, this uh, means all of the, the amount of flow coming from node I and dot J means the amount of flow going to dot, dot, dot J. So the way I like to think about this is, okay, we know something left Elix. How much does that tell us about whether or not it got to COD? And then aggregate that kind of across the entire system. And then one more step in this is, you can just rewrite this to give you a relative metric of ascendancy or efficiency scaled to the capacity value in that, in that network. And here's one reason why I think this relative efficiency metric is potentially a candidate for being useful and, and more relevant um, is that it does have an intuitive and universal scale between zero and one or between zero and 100%. Any questions? Okay. And nothing in the Q&A and um, Terrence, I, you'll unmute if okay. you have any in the room, yeah? Cool. All right, so one other way of thinking about the ascendancy or efficiency metric um, is to think about uh, the structure of the food web itself at, and its dimension. Wait, Sarah. Oh yeah. Sorry, the, the, I forgot about typing time. We have to give mm -hmm. them typing time. Two questions right. came through. Um, I think Andres came first. How precise is this metric? Um, he was thinking about some work he that, that Beth Fulton down in Australia had done, and that had a, the precision had become an issue. Have you encountered this? How precise is it? Great question. I will get into that briefly uh, later. Um, but I'm curious to hear about the those issues that you that you had in that case. Do you want to hear about it now? Maybe we'll hear about it later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we have a question from Lewis Barnett. Um, without having population structure, is there a method that works well for dealing with cycles and energy flow related to productivity and generation time? That is a great question. And it's definitely one of the, you know, um, simplifications that you take in a model like this is that there is no, we don't, we don't have age structure. Um, you can in ecopath or our path models. Um, but I think Yeah, I think here you're sort of looking at a, imagining a snapshot of flow in which, and, and then calculating based on that, if that makes sense. Lewis follows up, uh, evaluate the model at equilibrium. Yeah, so that's also a good question is, <laughs> Is is this version of the model at equilibrium? One of the um, one of the the constraints in the ecopath world is that you do need to um, kind of meet this uh, metric, this idea of balance. So, what that means is you need to make sure that there's not more. Uh, Product for any group, you don't have you're not accounting for more production than you have possible, or rather, right. Um, but you will eventually balance can account for change. Andre, can you explain what you mean by that? I can. Um, Andre is an active participant, so I'll just move on <laughs> to. <laughs> I don't know which Andre is the talking Andre, so I have to promote both of them. One moment, please, while those happen. <laughs> <laughs> he has two computers that he always logs in with. 
Um, and then I think that should allow him to chat with us. How about unmuting myself? Yeah, yeah that worked. Yeah, I, I, when you do a, a R path or eco, eco path model, you can have that with a biomass accumulation. Correct. Term. So you don't actually have to have a equilibrium, but you have to have a stable uh, ecosystem. So there is, and I was intrigued. I was going to ask about where biomass accumulation comes into this. Plays into this. For many of these, I mean, I'm your system may be different than most of the others, but most of them, you know, the data come from like many decades. So often you need that biomass accumulation term to, to deal with stability and how that determines, you know, linkages, I'm not at all sure. I can see this working for equilibrium, but not for models with um, with with that biomass accumulation term. And it's true. A lot of the thank you for that. And I and the models that I have do include several biomass accumulation terms. Um, a lot of the network analysis work does imagine a steady state. The metrics that I'm focused on actually are robust to that, and you don't need to meet a steady state assumption in order to apply them. That's one of the, one of the reasons I find them attractive. I did when I was doing these calculations account for biomass accumulation. Um, as in the import and export um, columns or as import export values, similarly to the way that they are applied to that ecopath balance. So in other words, the idea being that biomass accumulation is indicative of exchange into and out of the, the kind of prescribed or steady state system. That makes sense. Thanks. I, I didn't quite see where that came in the equations, but I'm sure you will explain. Yeah, so great question. Um, let me go back. Uh, this These flows here, I, I, I don't, the, the sort of schematic that I have is a bit simplified insofar as I did not include connections into or outside of that food web, but when, you, when I actually calculate the values, there are um, flows to detritus as well as where relevant import and export terms. And these, the metrics, the ascendancy and overhead metrics include all of those flows. One caveat being that anything, and they also include respiration flows, I should mention that too. Because from a flow perspective, you do want to account clearly for respiration. Um, does that help? I was trying to help Lewis, so let's see what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, if you want, I can also bring you up to panelist. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, I think I wanted to mention that there's this other way of thinking about this, the ascendancy metric having to do with essentially the shape or the geometry of a network. So you can think about the height, which we often analogize to or, or is equivalent to trophic level. And also the width, in other words, how many nodes do you have at a typical trophic level? And those are denoted as R and C. And it turns out empirically that modeled ecosystems, modeled food webs only occupy a subset of the possible space for both R and C. And that, the way that RNC is calculated, I didn't put up those equations here, but it relates back to ascendancy slash efficiency directly. Um, so the fact that these are constrained, again, by observation, also means that this relative efficiency score in real life ecosystems is itself constrained with an average observed of 0.4 or 40%. One standard deviation 
with being 0.36 to 0.44. And this fact, this observation is one of the other reasons that I think this particular metric is so intriguing from a sort of utility perspective, because it means that there's there can be an optimal or target as well as a range. And I like this figure because it sort of, at least in theory, hopefully communicates what that there has to be a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. And we can observe that there's a relatively narrow range in which ecosystems as modeled are uh, stable or viable that there's what's called a window of viability between, let's say that, that one, one standard deviation away. So let's say between 36% and 44%. And this fact has been mentioned in the literature as one of the sort of intriguing aspects of, in particular, these relative metrics. Um, but I, I still think it hasn't quite caught on as, <laughs> Uh, in terms of being applied. So hopefully by the end of today, I'll be still caught, be caught on more with this group. Um, okay, so to get back to that question of, has there been a regime shift or resilience change? I took my initial model and I fit it to time series data. And I used uh, trawl survey and landings data for the 43 groups where that's relevant as well as copepod data and phytoplankton data, although we only have that for the later part of the time series. And played around um, and got some, oh, and one other thing is that I relied on some work done by Maggie Heineken on who built a way to include temperature directly to have groups in the model directly respond by changing their consumption and respiration rates through temperature forcing. So that was a way to allow for what we saw over time to, to you know, show some of the, of what we understand about warming impacts in this particular system. And I, I fit that initial model to time series data, as I said, what you see here are some of the, I think, hopefully more compelling fits where the circles are observed biomass with error bars. And the line here is my model fit. Not every group fit the data perfectly, but I got to at least a stopping point that I felt pretty good about. And then I calculated that same that the relative ascendancy or relative efficiency metric for each annual time step. And that's what you see here with the orange line being a five-year running mean. So when I look at this, what I see is a decline in efficiency over the first 15 or so years of the time series, and then a sharp pivot to an increase an increase in efficiency, remember, is a decrease in resilience, followed by another decline and perhaps another increase. I have a question. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. No, um, no. Are, Andre wants to know, are these data or model outputs here? This is calculated from the model outputs. Sorry, I was talking about what you fitted the model to. That's fitted to data. I mean, not stock assessment outputs or anything naughty like, okay, great. No, we talked about that a lot. Um, I mean, I did, I did I only included stock assessment based estimates for pairing actually, because I was concerned that the, you know, bottom trawl survey wasn't best time series to use, but, but. Let's, yeah, almost entirely <laughs> try to stick to real data where, as much as possible. Um, so when I showed this result to Sarah and Sean, um, they immediately said, hmm, that, that period of swing of, of really rapid change in this 
system metric aligns with a period where you saw a generalized decline in body condition uh, as determined by weight and length relationships in the survey in a way that hasn't been kind of fully understood or explained. And perhaps there's a connection and I'm still exploring that, but I think it's pretty intriguing and exciting possible connection that again is, is maybe an argument for why these system-wide metrics can and should be of interest in a management context. I'm gonna skip this for now, actually, for the sake of time, I can come back to it. Um, so summary for that time, ser time series fitting results that I have so far is that we've seen an increase in the food web resilience for those first 15 years, followed by a decline and, a, and a, an increase again in more recent years, indicating perhaps there's been a shift to a new state, although the fluctuations might not be extreme enough to, to really make that clear. And I think I still need to process that a little bit. Um, and finally, <laughs> you know, I really think that that we shouldn't give up on network analysis metrics as being useful because if we hone in on one or two metrics that have a clear, you know, an intuitive scale and a can be described as having a target or target range value, then I think we can probably like hopefully make them more useful. Um, and then I, after doing all that, I had this question about, all right, well, um, how, how robust is that finding? And also, you know, when building any kind of model, but especially a food web model, there's a lot of uncertain parameter uncertainty in the starting point. And maybe you can actually leverage that uncertainty to better understand the food web and the, itself. So, Let's go back to our starting point. And in that, so this starting model, when I calculate my metric, I get this value of about 32%, which as you'll remember is lower than outside of that, that dominant range where we've observed ecosystems to want to sit. It's on the low end. It's only one value though. Um, and in order to incorporate parameter uncertainty, I relied on an EcoSense, um, which is a tool for basically um, incorporating our level of, of certainty or pedigree for each and every parameter that goes into the model. So I can assign a value typically between one and eight to each parameter biomass production, consumption, and diet for every group. And for some groups, you know, you feel more confident, okay, haddock biomass, feel feel pretty good about that. We know, you know, the survey is well-designed for haddock. Um, it's a direct estimate based on survey data. Another group like this other cephalopods group, a lot more uncertainty about that. So that's why I give it a score of an eight. And again, you do that for each and every parameter um, in the model. And then those scores determine a distribution. And then we ask Ecosense to sample from just the, all of the distributions for all of the parameters and generate new versions of that same food web. We then they test each one of those for, you know, basically essentially kind of some kind of thermodynamic viability or plausibility by running them forward and seeing if any groups blow up in terms of biomass or crash. And, and when I do this 50,000 times, most of the parameter sets fail, but some don't. And we get roughly a 3% success rate. So that out of like 50,000 runs, you get somewhere, something on the order of 1,800 successes. Or green guys. And then the next thing I did was calculate that same metric for each of my EcoSense successes. And what I found was a little surprising to me, honestly. Um, so this nice orange distribution 
is a score for all of the EcoSense out successes. Again, the mean is about 37, median something the same. Um, and but that's shifted over from where we saw that initial kind of first pass at, at parameterization that I had done in order to balance that ecopath or R path model. And this distribution is in some ways more in line with my expectation. It's closer to that literature-based value, both in the amount and, and the range. Um, and so this kind of got me thinking, well, what's different then uh, between my starting model and this ensemble? And here I'm gonna show you comparisons of flow. So think of it as the amount of biomass moving through each node. It's not just, it's not the, the standing biomass, it's the flow moving through it because that's the important quantity in these network-based models. And here I'm looking at comparing the ensemble mean so the mean value from, from all those successes to my starting model and uh, seeing that there's this big increase in phytoplankton flow in the, in the biomass moving through that phytoplankton node and also decreases in these two copepod groups that I've broken out as small and large as those are the biggest differences between my starting model and just the mean value from that whole ensemble. And then there's other there are just differences that you can see here as well. So um, so in other words, the versions that succeed and that have in EcoSense and that have this higher ascendancy score seem to have these specific differences in that in a few pathways at the lower trophic levels, namely phytoplankton and copepod based pathways. And just so you don't think like, oh, doesn't matter at all to fish. <laughs> um, you know, we also see flow differences between again that starting parameterization and the mean of the ensemble. Looking at other groups, um, including mackerel, um, Acadian redfish, cod, silver hake, and others. Although the scale here is smaller, the percent differences are smaller. Oh, I think there's a question in the chat. You're right. Um, what parameter is being solved for? Uh, these tend to be poorly surveyed species, except maybe the small pelagics. And oh. uh, what do you mean solved for like in the eco sense process? Is that, I think, what he means? Is that what you mean? Oh, Nope, in the auto balance algorithm. Which parameter are you solving for there? I don't use an auto balance algorithm. You don't? <laughs> no. That's interesting. Because I mean, usually with EcoPath, there's one parameter that isn't specified. Right, just because of the mass balance, you you won't you can't put in all the data automatically. You can't get you can't have all the parameters, right? Uh, and so usually you're missing at least one. And I was wondering if this is related, and in, and in that these are all estimate species that you probably don't have abundance estimates for, but you do have flows. Well, so I mean, they they are all groups where there was. Um, Data pedigree values are high, so where I'm letting the range, the possible range, be wide, right? That's true. Um, but I haven't, like, in all of the groups, we have specified 
starting values for biomass production and consumption and let the model solve for the EE, the ecotrophic efficiency, by and large. Yeah. Sounds like maybe you got to an answer for that question. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so then I thought, okay, well, that sort of one to, comparing just the the starting model to that ensemble gives us some information, but if we want to think about this as we're trying to imagine, or we might imagine that 40% or the 36 to 44 window as being a target, maybe it's useful to use those values as cutoff and label all the models that come out as below that as low efficiency. That's this 406 over here. Anything in our target range I called mid, I think. Uh, something like 1300, and then I had a few at that upper range as well. And then I asked, okay, for all of the nodes, the 56 nodes, are there statistically significant differences across between these groups? So first comparing this low low efficiency set to this middle efficiency or that are there statistically significant differences in flow between nodes? And related to my the, what I showed you before, but I think perhaps slightly, see this in a slightly different way. Um, these are the four comparisons that came out as statistically significant, at least what I've done so far, where again, you see that there's a lot of overlap but there are slight differences. So each point here is from one model and the lines are the means. And the, the most extreme difference is in this phytoplankton node where you see a higher flow in our middle kind of sweet spot, suite of models, and then lower flow in both of the copepod groups as well as in another one of these um, small zooplankton groups. And I compared the low and the high as well. The middle and the high, I didn't get any significant differences. And I, probably in part, that's because I just there weren't that many in the high. Um, but for similar patterns, big changes in phytoplankton and some changes in the copepods as well. So kind of left at what do we what do you make of this? And why does it matter? <laughs> um, I do think that this is giving us an at least a, an inkling, a hint at what are the pathways that are the most important at determining that overall network metric in this particular system. And if we can connect that to something like body condition, then hopefully we can make some step forward in terms of integrating these kinds of network metrics with, with decision-making and management. And also that, you know, the, no, the things that are popping out here are, um, are groups are, that, we're mo that we're monitoring. So phytoplankton and, and copepods are, or in, are being monitored regularly, perhaps, again, you can integrate that into a larger understanding and maybe even start to generate some kind of early warning signals of a larger, more systemic change. So to recap real quick, um, I think what we're seeing so far is that this a higher value of efficiency and perhaps a greater overall viability is linked to primarily two differences, increase in phytoplankton and low and a decrease in copepods that I think 
or more explicitly incorporating parameter uncertainty can help uncover different understanding or, or patterns that might otherwise be harder to parse. Um, and my hope is that connecting of certain tropic pathways to overall network properties will allow these types of food web models and monitoring to be more integrated more, more readily. Um, so those are all my slides. Hopefully we'll have some more discussion. I do wanna thank um, Kristen again for inviting me, folks at the NILAB who are wonderful, um, and Noah and C. Grant for sponsoring me in the fellowship. And just because I promised that I drive buses, I will <laughs> leave this picture up um, from my old days driving around in an in a old bus. And I'm, yeah, very happy for more questions. Thank you, Sarah. That's great. Um, so folks in the projectorless classroom with Terrence or folks online, you can use the Q&A um, feature to drop some questions or the raise hand feature if you want to talk with Sarah live, any follow-up questions or hypotheses on why this sort of one snapshot could be so different. But I don't know, more stories from other uses of this modeling framework like Andre hinted at earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andre, come in. I'll only ask a question if no one else does. I've asked a lot already. <laughs> but it looks like no one else is, so mm -hmm. I will. Um, yeah, so firstly, that was great, Sarah. I like, I like, you know, this is the use of these models is 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 a challenging, but you know, potentially sort of life changing. Um, what I was really interested in, maybe you haven't had a chance to think about this, is you refer to the term used in management, mm. um, and what do you mean by that? So, how would you, if you were, you know, if you took over the New England Fishery Management Council? <laughs> Um, something that I think you should do with a careful <laughs> decision making. Um, you know, what what is this? What is, how does this help us? I mean, my my initial thought is it's relevant to sort of reference periods for ref for fisheries reference points and things yeah. like that. Um, but I I guess I I couch that with you know the the work that Cody Suzwalski has been looking at, which is you know, if your ecosystem is going down the toilet over time, do you really want to say, well, that's fine, we'll just redefine our reference points as lower and lower and lower. So, um, you know, what, you know, if, if we decide we love it, what do we do with it? I think one thing is, um, could be integrated in the sense, like, if your ecosystem, you expect it to be, you know, at risk, Right, maybe that encourages more caution. If you have indicated indication that you're likely, yeah, undergoing a larger systemic shift, I think you're right. Potentially, you could imagine that your older reference points are not, you know, are are less applicable. Um, but I think. I think it's a, right. Yeah, I, th I think that those are my first thoughts. Like, it's good to know. Do we believe that the system is stable as is? And if the answer to that is no, doesn't that inspire potentially more caution or urge potentially more caution writ large kind of across the board? And if the answer to that is yes, maybe, you know, less, not less caution, but <laughs> there's not a need for extra caution. What do you think about that way of, you know, including more holistic measures as, as a, another um, I, 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 I think there's a lot to be said for that, but I, I think that, you know, one of the challenges with all of this ecosystem work is exactly this question is what does it mean we all we all say it should be used in management because we get funding for doing that saying those words and degrees and all sorts of nice things uh but it you know thinking about how it fits into the the 
the, the management system, I think would be, you know, a nice discussion point in the paper that you're going to write and saying, this is actually useful and this is how I could do it. But I, I think the answer is no one really knows right now. And that's one of, that's been one of the challenges. If Sarah is on here, she'll probably disagree with me, but you know, we shall see. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. Um, Terrence, I see your hand up. I'm going to go with Kristen Marshall's question first because it came in before. Um, also, just it looks like Gavin Fay has posted that the Northeast Fisheries Management Council is hiring for several jobs right now. If anyone is, I'm just guessing Gavin suggested because this is how we're going to ascend to becoming the <laughs> council. So uh, thank you, Gavin. All right, back to Kristen. Um, this is super interesting. I'm wondering about the coherence between the network metric mm -hmm. from the food web model and the empirical data you showed. Do you think you would essentially get the same trend if you fit something like a DFA to the empirical observations based on condition? Mm, maybe. <laughs> um. I haven't tried that. Uh, I did, one of the figures that I skipped over is not a DFA, but I, I was worried when I first, oh, sorry for that. Um, I was worried when I first saw this that potentially, you know, this was really, because of what I sort of knew about the important role of those lower trophic groups, I was worried, or I was, had the thought that perhaps this change over time was really due to fluctuations just in those lower trophic level groups and wasn't really giving us an indication about fish. Um, so I did do like a basic PCA where, I cut, but I cut off the groups at the upper trophic level. So I looked at everything trophic level three and above. Um, and I did see, you know, well, I did see, let's kind of see it here, that that there is a similar temporal pattern where you have similarity for the first 15 or so years of the time series, and then a change about 2000 that persists, um, and then another slightly different, um, you know, system, again, looking only at the trophic levels in the later years. But um, this was, I think when I did this, it was a little while ago now, I think this was from the modeled biomass and not the actual observations. So that's a good idea. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, the order, <laughs> uh, first for Andre, Sarah Geitch says, I always jump at the chance to disagree with Andre. <laughs> Sarah, I aspire to attain that level one day in my post <laughs> Um, so well, I'm going to go to the classroom real quick, Terrence, for a question, and then to Lewis Barnett after that, and then I'll I'll get back to the rest of the list. Albie's got a question. Yeah, I had a question. Thank you for your talk. It, it seems like your uh, sampling uh, algorithm wanted to go for models where the phytoplankton fluxes were higher. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's, that's what correct. I took. Yeah, yep. and uh, I'll, I'll say that that is not dissimilar from what we saw with some ecosystem models in the Gulf of Alaska, where mm -hmm. when uh, we first built the model with our best guess at what the biomasses and the fluxes between these groups would have been, and then the model said, I'm going to need more phytoplankton to work, essentially. And, and that had a couple of issues, a couple of reasons that we boiled that down to. One of them was that the way that these models are uh, conceptualized, uh, they, you know, like the, the food web looks a little bit like a pyramid, right? You can't have a large standing stock of zooplankton, which we had in the Gulf of Alaska. It's like very energy rich zooplankton. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't have that in the model without having enough phytoplankton to support that zooplankton biomass. Uh, mm -hmm. That was one thing. The other thing was also that uh, all this stuff has pretty wild seasonal trends, at least yeah. in the Pacific. I, I presume, I presume in your area as well. So it kind of Definitely. depends a little bit on where, like when, what time of the year the data that you use is from, whether it's from you know spring blooms or other times of the year. So I was wondering, kind of in your case, if you have 
accounted for seasonality a little bit in 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 these in these considerations. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, I, it's interesting to know that you saw something similar. Um, and I did. It I think what's interesting to me is not only that it it selects for more phytoplankton, but that it's also looking at selecting for lower flux through some of those zooplankton nodes as well. And maybe those are all related, but I was sort of expecting there to be actually more of a signal from some of the benthic groups because the, and at least in our model, those are really big players in terms of both standing stock and flux. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is highlighting something slightly different than maybe what it could have shown at least. And in terms of seasonality, I didn't incorporate seasonality in this, although yeah, it's an annual time step and an annual average. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sarah, um, I also note that Hemnalini Morzaria Luna sent a paper um, where they use several of these same metrics to compare across Ecopath metal models. Um, I emailed that to you, so it's in your inbox, and you don't have to try to save the link um, during this talk. So it's in your inbox now. Um, next, Lewis, I have you um, on doc. You can unmute. I don't know if it's the same question you um, submitted, but whichever preference you want, Lewis. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just go more off the cuff. Um, th thanks very much, Sarah. That was, that was a great talk. I really like the framing and I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of developing more, you know, useful summaries of, of what's going on in the ecosystem. But I guess I'm used to thinking about resilience hmm. more um, specifically, like in the classical, like really simple model sense, like where there are, if there are truly multiple stable equilibria and so forth and so on. So I, I was just in the questions earlier, I was just trying to ask, um, trying to figure out, you know, what, what the, the measure of resilience really is. But um, coming back around to the question I asked in the chat, um, maybe, you know, a, a useful way of thinking about this type of analysis mm -hmm. isn't necessarily reliant upon considering whether the, the system's in a stable state, because like you said, there's no, there's no equilibrium per se in this model, right? So the analysis does, doesn't rely on this assumption of, you know, a stable and an unstable state and so forth. So maybe, um, I guess the question is, what do you think about just using this type of model, uh, the analogy being just exploring the, that landscape of the ball and cup model or it's not a cup at all, right? It's just a slope or something like that. But you're you're doing doing some perturbations of the model to kind of explore uh, the potential range of, of states in the system given some realistic uh, perturbation or environmental driver. Is that a, a good way of thinking about how this could you know influence management? I think so. If I'm understanding you, um, and I think. Another p possible way that I've at least works out in my mind is, okay, um, wait, we do, a, you know, can you assess the likelihood that any combination of management decisions and environmental perturbations and any other perturbations you might add would lead to uh you know your system moving one way or to one extreme or another on that spectrum right so maybe that's another that's one way that i think about it which i think is maybe similar to what you're suggesting like how much do you have to push the system to get it out to get it to change Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, like maybe some sometimes people refer to that as resistance. You know, how much right. does it take to get it out to another state? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of different 
metrics of those specific things that would be useful maybe in the context of like ecosystem status reports as an indicator time series or something like that. That's just, it, or in my thought process of thinking about Andre's question, how does it influence management? We still don't know how to act on it, but maybe we could make an indicator that relates or, you know, s s is a, a simplified explanation of the possible states of a really complex system. And yeah, and you, the you don't have to comment on that. Uh, sorry yeah, to ask such a concrete question and, right like, at the end of time. No, 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 it's okay. And like, you know, I guess ideally in my mind, it's like, and some level, even qualitative of associated risk, right? If you're saying, okay, we think that we're at a, you know, 36, let's say. And we also think that there's, you know, a meaningful... There's low risk of that changing based on what we have observed and project, or there's a you know moderate risk of that changing, but not outside of a, a desired range, or there's a high level of, of plausible risk here, such that you might want to sort of imagine even more caution again to use that word. So I don't know. But I don't want to give up on these. I guess that's my <laughs> my 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 message. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm noting the time. And yeah. I do want to take a moment to thank you again for coming into our quantitative seminar family and sharing your work. I know it can be an uncertain. A uh, thing to jump into another school's culture and you did it amazingly and um, thank you everyone for attending and supporting Sarah with your questions um, and with that I will close our meeting and invite you to join us for seminar next week we will be uh, featuring Stacy Stacy Ambergy from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife so again people in the room give a big wave to Sarah make her feel loved Thank you, everyone. Thank you, people in the room. <laughs>